We are live. Welcome to The Punisher Season 1 Thoughts. So, spoilers for everything MCU leading up to and including the season. And yeah, so real quick, the order, I'll do the rest of the Marvel Netflix shows. One video per day, so on average two weeks between episodes. Jessica Jones Season 2, Luke Cage Season 2, Iron Fist Season 2, Daredevil Season 3, The Punisher Season 2, and finally Jessica Jones Season 3. This video will be shorter than my usual full season thoughts video because of the back pain. So yeah, I'll start by saying I I love, I really love this season. Like there's very little I take issue with. I think they do a great job, you know, because of Netflix budget. It's not this was never going to be just like non-stop you know wall-to-wall -wall action the, the you know and at times the action isn't as big as the the Punisher movies and when you're faced with that you know basically you can try to distract the audience by giving them something else that is maybe inexpensive or you can try to, you know, do a character study, and I really appreciate that they went for the, the character study. And, let's see, yeah, the, the action choreography was amazing. I'll talk some more about that at the end of this video. So, worst to best, filmed Punisher, and I'm talking about both, you know, film and show, as well as the Punisher actor's performance. 89, 2004, Warzone, and Netflix Season 1. So, yeah, I had a few political issues. Other than that, I really love this season. And, yeah, other than this season, Marvel Netflix, worst to best. Love all but Iron Fist Season 1. Iron Fist Season 1, Daredevil Season 2. The Defenders, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, and Jessica Jones Season 1. And Arts Cafe, I hope to do a video on The Exterminator tomorrow so if if nothing goes wrong tomorrow is when it'll be up and yeah so that let's, with that let's jump into the first episode 3 a.m now let's see yeah so i i think they do do a really great job you know the the opening is this flashback where he's teaching his daughter guitar and then intercut with present day reminiscing of that so immediately we are feeling the pain that he still can't escape you know before we even get the the action scene which is awesome you know the bikers van chase he runs them over and punisher followed the last surviving member of the cartel to el paso sniped him badass zoom out which is of course you know if they didn't open with action a lot of people you know not the not the hardcore fans not the people who are here because they love this character and appreciate how much you can do with him how much depth you can get in there but the people just there for the action they're going to tune out if it's not immediately so we do get some really cool action immediately and Frank chokes Mickey in the bathroom, and it just sounds like sex to others in the bathroom. And Frank burns the armor vest with the logo. It would not be a Marvel Netflix show if it did not star a reluctant hero, or in this case, anti-hero. That makes five solo and one team out. They are six for six. I gotta say, I don't think it was necessary. You know, this is the, the last... I, I have now watched at least one season of every Marvel Netflix show... And all of them do this, at least with the first season. And that, I do not think, was completely necessary. And, yeah, I, I really like the intro sequence. Uh, you know, we see guns being fired and, you know, ultimately forming the letters and the logo for the show. And, yeah, we see that Frank is now working at a construction site, breaking walls with a hammer. And... Yeah, like, he he has no more people to turn this, you know, to, to unleash violence upon, so, yeah, a wall, you know, that, that's, I mean, it's almost like a metaphor, you know, the, the, he is, he just can't quite, you know, he, he can't 
break down his emotional walls, so he breaks down real life physical. Uh, not saying real emotions are real life. I mean physical. You know, something that exists outside of his body is what I mean. Uh, you know, outside of his body and his mind. And yeah, you know the the. Let's see. Yeah, killing the the people responsible for his family's deaths did not give him the catharsis he wanted. You know, he really should have listened to, to Harley Quinn on that. Was that movie out by the... Uh, anyway. And the... Um, yeah, you know, it does not give you the catharsis. You might think it will not solve the, the trauma. The You know, he has PTSD. And I really appreciate that the show... Uh, you know, it's, it's not pretending otherwise. Uh, you know, it, it used to be... This really, you know, people used to, some some people do still, sadly, feel a lot of shame about their PTSD. But today, it is something you can openly discuss in a piece of fiction, you know. And, yeah, it, it is, you know, in the comics as well. They, they didn't make up that he has PTSD for the show. He has it in the comics as well. But it's not really something that, you know, the... All, th all of these, you know, the the movies also get across the. I, I suppose eighty nine, not necessarily PTSD, but definitely trauma. Actually, yeah, maybe maybe PTSD. Anyway, let's see. And you know, at the construction site, Donnie, the new guy, seems like he has some empathy for Frank, but or Pete. But the, you know, the ones who've been there for a while call him the R word. I appreciate the show pointing out that trauma like PTSD can lead to behavior that the ignorant might mistake for mental impairment. And he does eat lunch, but not with the others. And he dreams of his children and wife like they're still alive, which is just heartbreaking. And the others hate Frank because the work he does means they're getting less overtime. And, you know, I, I quite like the, the character of Donnie. It's almost too bad that he's so little in the, the show, but he is essentially, you know, he's there to set up these, you know, some, some themes. But yeah, you know, Donnie gets Frank a sandwich. They talk. Well, Donnie does. He's struggling to pay for his grandmother's medical bills. This in addition to the PTSD group meeting, you know, there's a real theme in this season of the American government not taking care of veterans and you know so so yeah that's that's one of the themes that sets up another is that Frank you know he basically he wants to be alone but he does care about the little guy you know and basically like he's not trying to be cruel to Donnie but he does legitimately feel you know later in the season he does start to open up to other people now, let's see. I really appreciate this is a show that makes clear not all male aggression is a positive, which is obviously important for a show where the lead is a man who kills people. And, yeah, you know, Frank waits outside the, the PTSD group therapy session, and the Christian Nationalist talks about a civil war. Another thing that is important for the show to criticize, a lot of Christian nationalists love the titular character. And yeah, Frank listens to a PTSD group session, but doesn't join because that's how MCU military vets with shows or movies named after them roll, baby. And yeah, we learn Frank has a new identity. He has now killed everyone involved in his father fa family's death, or so he thinks. You know, we later do find out, yeah. And we meet DHS officer Madani. I really love her line to her boss that ends with bravo. And Donnie goes to drink with the other construction workers, maybe because Frank turned him down and he needs friends. Yeah, that you, you immediately can tell this is not gonna go well. And it's not it's not immediately it doesn't immediately go south, but him trying to be friends with them does. And 
Yeah, they mentioned the Nucci Loan Shark, Nucci from Welcome Back Frank. I was a little surprised that there were so few Nucci's in this, I guess maybe season two, since he does kill some here, but it sort of gets covered. Like, like I've, isn't this where Karen writes a story that makes it sound like a murder-suicide rather than vigilantism? And yeah, you know, it would be okay if, you know, I'm not going to be like hating the show if the if I never get more new cheese it's fine if it's just a one off reference to so welcome back frank and yeah the guy has to do a job obviously illegal you said you were buying right he said first round asshole that's money that should go to his grandma's medical bills he hasn't worked there as long as they have so they've had more of a chance to save up and they're gonna hit a Nucci place. They're angry that Frank was nearby and heard it. He grabs the hammer, they threaten him, and it's one of those things where we viewers might want him to hurt the two, but, you know, then he would have to get a job to hide somewhere else, and, you know, it's it's like in The Incredible Hulk 1, that, I say, as if there's, if there is an Incredible Hulk 2, or ever will be an Incredible Hulk 2. Anyway, yeah, the, the, you know when he's at the at the factory and the the guys harass him now yeah and and one of the guys for the job got his arm broken and they ask Donnie very tense and suspenseful when they attack the Nucci place and Donnie drops the bag and his ID and Paul Paulie Nucci I think it is reads out his first name and he explains later he was thinking what if the cops pull them over? He should have his license, which does make sense. It's not that he's just, you know, he didn't think maybe he shouldn't bring his license since, you know, identification is, yeah. And Frank has more PTSD nightmares. Holy shit, his wife got shot in the head right in front of him. That was in the trailer, and I still jumped in my seat when I saw it in the show. And, yeah, you know, he... Let's see. Yeah, you know, waking up to that, of course he's gonna go use the hammer at the construction yard. First on the wall, then the construction workers. They were gonna kill Donnie so that he won't give them up after torture. They throw him in the cement makes or Mr. Terwilliger. Frank takes the three of them on with nothing but the hammer. Amazing fight. They got hammered twice, and this time Donnie didn't have to pay. And he gets the information on where they went, helps Donnie out of the mixer, leaving the others. And it's you know it's a great bit of of poetic justice. You know they were gonna hide Donnie's body there, and you know it is that thing of you know if you dig a grave for someone else, you might just be digging your own grave, especially if you fuck with Frank F F Castle. And. Yeah, and, and Frank kills, you know, the, yeah, po I guess Paulinucci and the others would go after Donnie. I think the fact that they were going to attack, even though they know he lo lives with his grandmother, and he doesn't even tell them to protect her, just do what you have to to get the information. You know, if Frank hadn't killed them, they would have tortured Donnie's grandmother. And if Frank had killed the cops, they wouldn't have gotten there on time. You know, it's... A good idea for vigilante fiction today to explain why the vigilante is necessary. That wasn't always, you know, it used to just be, you know, you open a comic book and it's like, oh, vigilante is good, you know, but now you kind of have to justify it. Not, not all the time, but it's a good idea. But, but yeah, I, I feel like that's when Frank decided that he would kill them all. Very cool scene. Take, you know, he takes out the lights, gunfires the one thing, only thing illuminating. Welcome back, Frank. We missed you. That brings us to the second episode, Two Dead Men. And Frank is mistaken for a hipster and reads a Karen Page article, which appears to be intentionally covering up for Frank killing the Nucci people. And Micro calls the cafe, describes Frank is vague on the phone. Frank runs, gets the roof, but Micro wasn't on that roof. Had a mirror and light set up to lure him there. Left the cell phone. And... Let's see. Yeah, so, so Frank watched the video, and Madani also watched that video, and... 
you know, wants to find out, you know, more about it. And, yeah, and, you know, Frank meets up with Karen, who still has the gun. He praised her for getting, agrees to look into Micro, hugs him. I, I really liked uh, Karen's presence uh, on, on this show. You know, it makes so much sense. Of, of all the pun... Uh, the, of all the Daredevil supporting characters, or, the, in, I mean, in that show, she's a major character. You know, yeah, it makes the most sense. You know, they had a fairly close relationship, and she does basically approve of, you know, yeah, she's been quite consistent on that, hasn't she? Being in favor of vigilantism as long as it hits people who are guilty. I, th I think she's been completely consistent on that. You know, she was in favor of Daredevil even when Foggy thought that he was a terrorist, even when a lot of people were repeating the, the news media's claims that he was a terrorist. I forget if I said in, in that video, but that really is a great, like, top-notch commentary on an exploration of, you know, yeah, sometimes you can't trust the mainstream media. Sometimes they will angle things in a way that, uh, yeah, or go off uh, in, uh, what's it called, in insufficient information. <clears throat> and Ellison helps Karen with the story. Micro watches his family who believe he's dead via surveillance cameras. And, and and after he talked to Frank on the phone, we also have several shots that, you know, were made to look like live surveillance footage. And it was, you know, letting us know, yeah, uh, Micro is watching him. <clears throat> and Dina meets Billy Russo. I appreciate the detail that Dina and Billy both tell Sam that him accidentally shooting a hostage was better than risking dying, and that's, you know, I'll, I'll, yeah, I was gonna say that's not necessarily the show condoning, although I suppose in the long term, the show is maybe, s no, no, actually, yeah, I think it is saying that, you know, Frank holds himself to a higher standard. Frank would really beat himself up if he accidentally shot a hostage. <coughs> he holds himself to a higher standard, standard than the the law enforcement and the law enforcement can't they, they aren't as efficient as he is at you know removing threats from the street so that's probably what they're they're going for there and let's see I, I quite liked, you know, Micro, you know, is very unhappy. Frank is approaching his family, grabs a gun, gets in the car, tried to contact Frank, who takes the battery out of the phone. And there's trouble with the electric garage door. Frank fixes it. And Frank shaves all facial hair down to stubble, trims down the hair on his head. At the time, I didn't really think about, but I guess it's for the, you know, so that when he puts on the ski mask which i feel like has anybody ever w worn it in a movie or tv show and they were going skiing i feel like it's always like i i, f I get maybe they wouldn't move as many units if when you go into the store it just says bank robbery attire but i mean isn't that basically what it is at, at this point I'm, I'm not sure i've ever heard of anyone actually using it as a ski i think if i saw in a movie or TV show that someone was wearing a ski mask and going skiing, I would assume that they were either they either just got done robbing somewhere and now they're escaping, or that they're going to ski to where they're gonna rob a place. And yeah, you know, Wolf is attacked in his home. We see it's Frank. Great f fight. And let's see, Frank hits Wolf. Wolf up for info by literally hitting him and shooting him in the leg. Gets info on Schoonover, and Wolf gets free. Unmasks Frank, but Frank had planned on it. He knew that the way to get Wolf to talk was making him think that, you know, that he only, that that he had won. You know, the gun was empty. It had, it, you know, there was only one bullet in it that he used on Wolf. 
I don't know if that's a reference to Guardian Devil. I'd like to think it is. I, I, no, I, I, I do not think that I'm going to get an, you know, a live action adaptation of Guardian Devil. I do think it would be super cool, but you know, yeah. And in the bar, Billy points out the Afghans have been fighting for 1,000 years. And Madani and Billy connect in the bar. I quite appreciate. In the in the finale, he says, you know, Afghans kill each other all the time. You know, black on black crime. Is, you know, so so basically, that that's what he really thinks. You know, he thinks, ah, the, the, you know, they're beneath me. They're always killing each other. I might as well kill some. You know, the. He, he thinks they're worthless. He doesn't. He's, he has dehumanized them in his mind, which you know that is something that propaganda causes, and a lot of military people have to to go through. And with Billy, we see that he has chosen to keep that perspective long after he you know he hasn't killed an Afghan. Uh, what, what did they say it was six six years? I, I forget exactly, but but yeah, he still thinks of it that way. You know, which of course is also a way for him to avoid feeling guilty that he killed Afghans back then, but, you know, still. So, so yeah, when he tells, when he in the bar says, the Afghans have been fighting for a thousand years, you know, in his mind, he's thinking, you know, they're, they're subhuman, but he makes it sound as the, like this, you know, it, it sounds almost like sage wisdom, right? you know, They've been fighting for a thousand years, you know, us getting involved, that's just a tiny thing for them. It's it's life, it's existence, you know. And meanwhile, he's thinking, yeah. And, yeah, with Wolf dead, Madani is the ranking officer. And Frank found a way to avoid the gate analysis. I gotta say, when I watched... Ah, uh, let me think. I think it was the fifth one. Mission Impossible 5, I thought they made up gate analysis. Because uh, there's so much in those movies that they just made up, you know. But, yeah, apparently it's real. And Frank takes charge of the relationship with Micro, with the cell phone, having him drive to different locations, meet up with Kurt. And Frank hid in the trunk of Micro's car, knocks him out. Great hook, you know. You, you really want to see what happens next. Episode 3, Kandahar, and Danny tries to talk Frank out of interrogating him. That alarm. Well, we did all watch Lost. Not sure how many of us took it as a manual. And Danny inputs the code. Frank threatens Danny, explaining what he'll do, and Danny talks. And... Danny leaves the car at seeing the armed men, very tense and suspenseful, as Wolf reaches him and shoots. And Dina won't give a statement, but also won't let the other departments take over. And let's see. Yeah, we we've got a flashback to you know military service, some bonding. And, you know, there's that, uh, I guess, Gunner, you know, he, he, like, quotes scripture or something. And honestly, at first, when he, when he then was like, I'm just kidding, I thought he meant that he wasn't actually religious, but I guess he, he is religious. It's just that he realizes that sometimes people get kind of creeped out if he's, like, quoting the Old Testament in all seriousness. So he uses it as sort of a, an icebreaker, which... Yeah, and, you know, again, the show, it's smart of them to make it clear Frank isn't a religious lunatic. It's not that he thinks, oh, you know, all who have sinned against the Lord must die. No, it, you know, yeah, the, over the course of this season, you get very clear indications of what Frank's boundaries and just the, yeah, wh what he'll do, and who he'll do it to, and, and yeah. Spin me around, Frank, like a record baby. Danny reveals what will really happen if he doesn't answer the code, confronts Frank about what they did to Zubair, 
you know, despite the government's efforts, we do now know American military men did war crime, committed war crimes in the Middle East. I really appreciate this show confronting that. And let's see. Dina and her mom talk. It feels a lot like the scene is informed by their Iranian heritage. I don't think the scene would play out the same if they were white. And Danny pricks Frank with the pen, which knocks him out. Clever backup plan, because it's a it's a pen. You know, he's always using it to type. You know, Frank isn't gonna think twice about it. But then, you know, he yeah. And Lewis almost shoots his father because of a PTSD flashback. His father is understanding, but Lewis himself is understandably very upset. I think this might be chronologically out of order, but at one point in this episode, Frank imagines himself executing his wife in a mask. You know, basically, you know, he feels that it is his fault, which, you know, it's one of those things, he didn't know it was going to happen, but, yeah, the, the fact that they did these war, the, they committed war crimes, and then the, you know, that, ah, well, let's see. Let's see. The, the the evidence reached Dina that is why Frank's family were, were killed and they attempted to murder him. And it, it is also this thing of, you know, there uh, some, some American movies more recently have acknowledged that a lot of the time when America is... Uh, when they face threats from other countries, many times, or, or, you know, just non-white people, many times it is because, yeah, when white America is, you know, scared of non-white America or other countries, yeah, frequently it's because they or their an ancestors, yeah, not descendants, but ancestors did, you know, com yeah, committed violent acts, sometimes not violence, sometimes psychological violence, but yeah, violent acts towards either the people who they're now scared of or their ancestors, and there's a generation generational trauma there, and and here it's it's a very direct, you know, kind of he killed an Afghan. Let me think, undercover cop, I think he was, but there's so much information this season, I didn't, I can't keep all of it straight uh, right now. I gotta admit, but. I believe Zubair was an undercover Afghan cop. He was innocent. He was not a terrorist. He did not co- you know, he wasn't working with terrorists. And, you know, yeah, basically, like, if, um, in, in real life, uh, actually, yeah, I can imagine something, I don't know with 100% certainty, but I can imagine something like Operation Cerberus did happen in real life. But otherwise, it kind of made me think of stuff like, Abu Ghraib and uh, wait Abu Ghraib hey crap I it's been a while since I heard it pronounced I forget how you pronounce it and Gitmo you know so yeah you know and and yeah let's, you know to finish my thought in this it is a very direct consequence you know Frank ah uh, let me think was he the one crap I forget if he was the one who pulled the trigger or I, I, I believe he was the one who pulled the trigger on Zubair and, and likely others, you know, and yeah, you know, so now he imagines that he was the one who pulled the trigger killing his wife, uh, you know, and in a sort of, you know, he, he didn't kill his wife directly, but his actions did lead to... If he had refused to kill... If, if no one had executed Zubair, you know, they wouldn't have had anything to hide. They wouldn't have had a reason to kill Frank's family, to keep it hidden. And, and I, I gotta say, I really like how Danny, you know, kind of complicates... Like, in Daredevil Season 2, by the end, it seems like, oh, he's thought, you know, he's killed everyone that he needed... You know, everyone involved is, you know, he, uh, he didn't kill all of them, but all of them are dead. You know, he, I, f I forget what her name and status was, uh, DA maybe? He he shouted, I'm going to take you down with me, you witch, or something along those lines. He called her a witch. 
he didn't kill her, Schoonover did. But, yeah, the, the, um, by the end of Daredevil Season 2, it appears that everyone, that Frank, you know, wanted to, to punish for the murder of his family were dead. And then, you know, at the very top of Episode 1 of this season, we see him kill just a couple more people that, you know, got away from, you know, so by the end of Daredevil Season 2, it doesn't feel like, oh, his, I mean, his story is still completely unfinished here. No, it feels like, oh, okay, they've, they've wrapped it up, he can start on a new story. And really, what they're doing in this season with, with Micro is expanding that story. Uh, you know, the... the uh, let's see... I forget how much we knew in Daredevil Season 2, but, but sh for sure, in this one, we find out, you know, the, the people responsible and why they did it. You know, they were hiding a heroin smuggling operation where they were, you know, stuffing drugs into the dead bodies of, you know, of their own fallen. And they executed Zubair and possibly... I mean, I've, yeah, there were probably other, let me think, I think every single person they executed was wrong, you know, it, it was illegal, it was, it was completely the wrong thing to do, but the one they have a video of, you know, Gunner realized this guy is not a terrorist, we should not be doing this, so he filmed it, and, you know, got the, got the video to Micro, and, um, they, yeah, Micro got it to, to Madani. And, yeah, you, you know, this, this, you know, by the end of this season, it is genuinely resolved. We, we completely understand everything that, you know, surrounded his, um, what's the word? Um his family's murder. And let's and we see some of the mission that was described in the courtroom in Daredevil season two. Frank keeps pounding a soldier, his face gets increasingly bloody, long take, badass. And Frank is furious at Orange punches him. Frank, look at yourself. You look like shit. And Frank agrees to Danny's mission on the condition that they all die, no trials. And that brings us to episode four, Resupply. And we see that Louis the Vet, you know, digs himself a place to sleep in the yard. He's more comfortable there than inside because it rem reminds him of service. Frank interrogates Turk. Great character moments for both of them. And Frank is, of course, frustrated. They didn't get the guns. NYPD didn't know. DHS is in on it and didn't share with them. Frank cleans Danny's gun. He's not happy about it. I, I kind of like, you know, it was pretty funny when, you know, in, in general, like, I at times I didn't, I, I found it a little annoying that, Danny and Frank are arguing so much of the season, so much of their screen time. But it was pretty funny when, you know, Frank is, you know, cleaning gun and he's like, say your son gets a dog, but he doesn't feed it, doesn't take it for walks, the dog pisses on the floor. What do you do? You kill the dog. <laughs> yeah. Because he's like, that's all Frank ever does is violence, you know. And that's also, you know, I really appreciate that there is someone who shares Frank's hatred of the the men that Frank kills, but says, you know, and he's okay with Frank killing them, but he still confronts Frank and says, you know, I, th I think at one point he says something like, all you have is violence, it's violence and war, something like that, and... You know, that is, yeah, there needs to be more. He can't only do that. That's, you know, yeah. It's it's not healthy. for, for It's not good for his mental health. 
and let's see. yeah, Kurt, Kurt talks to Lewis, who spaces out. Kurt makes logical suggestions about the whole, and Billy gives a great speech to the Anvil recruits. I appreciate how, like, I didn't really think about it at the time, but yeah, every so often Anvil is brought up, and we find out a little more about Billy and Anvil, and, you know, once Lewis is no longer in the show, Anvil is still necessary and important, and because of Lewis, we got some, you know, yeah, some development there, character development. And... And Frank uses a grenade to psych out the gunmen, kills them. He and Danny get transportation. Curtis manages to talk Billy out of accepting Lewis. And, yeah, Billy fires Lewis, who finds himself hating Kurt, calling him a snake. Let's see. And Danny doesn't think he can do the mission with Frank and Danny plays music over comms. You are both on comms right now. Frank hops atop the truck. Dina won't call off. That was a really, really cool scene. The the whole thing just yeah. And Frank flamethrower from back of truck, just like in Comet. I think that's also from Welcome Back, Frank. And let's see. Dina drives. She and Frank chase and then play chicken. Danny hits her from the side. Dina recognizes Frank, gets confirmation he killed Wolf. So, you know, the two have met, what is that, a third into the season? Or less than a third in. And... Yeah, so this is also out of order chronologically. chronologically I like the discussions between Danny and Frank about what makes a good husband. Uh, you know, these things of just... Yeah, and that's also, like, you can't really... I, uh, I don't think very many Punisher fans would be hugely interested in a show or movie where, like, a huge chunk of it is just, like, you know, Frank with his family before they get killed. There is some of that in the 2004 one, and that works well. But, you know, it's also because it means that we, you know, it hits harder than when we see, you know, them, them die and, and such. But, but yeah, um, so I appreciate that, you know, his relationship with Sarah, Leo, and Zack is him, you know, as a husband and father, you know, not, not exactly, but, you know, to, to some degree, and just, it's, it's very important to humanize a character like this, or it's just going to be uh, us watching a lot of slaughter, slaughter. And that is a thing that, you know, I, I wasn't sure the, you know, I only recently watched the 1989 movie. I was not sure that one was going to have that, especially since, you know, so many people hate it, which I, I thought it was pretty good. Not, you know, amazing, not the best ever, but, you know, that one, even that one manages to make sure to humanize him because, like, sure, it's cool. Like, I feel like if you're going to have a character that is just, you know, completely merciless and just loves killing and that kind of thing. I feel like it works for a, a video game. Maybe also, I've, I feel like I've read comic books that, that manage that fine. But a movie or TV show, if he's the protagonist, I mean, then it kind of has to be a, a villain. Ah, yeah. No, no, yeah, if you're not going to explore the character, like, I haven't watched Hannibal, but I hear that it explores, you know, the, the, yeah, the titular character, Hannibal Lecter, Hannibal the Cannibal. So, yeah, yeah, I, I don't think, if, if there's no depth to them, it can work in a video game, it can work in a comic book, it is not going to be compelling to, to watch for just, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so we... It's, 
yeah, we see Dina's injuries. Shade's having been at Frank's mercy. So far, there's a lot of drama and conflict between Danny and Frank. In the other Marvel Netflix shows, there would be that kind of thing, but it would be because characters other than the lead have different opinions than the lead on whether or not they should do the vigilante thing. Here they agree about the vigilante thing, so it has to be about personalities as such. I approve. And Leo analyzes Life of Pi. What are you doing here? I'm baking a cake. And Leo tries to convince Sarah to invite Frank. She's reluctant, so when Frank comes in, Leo invites him and says that it's on behalf of her mother. And Zack is clearly uncomfortable with Frank, and he ultimately agrees to the dinner. Gunnar Henderson was wearing the camera. So this is somewhat like whistleblowers Edward Snowden and Chelsea Manning. Again, very relevant. I really approve that. Because, yeah, you know, there are so many... You know, for a long time, it was considered all right in the mainstream to basically say, no, 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 they, you know, the whistleblowers are the bad people. It's not that the American military did anything wrong. And, you know, yeah, by the time that they made this season... You know, it was okay in something, you know, this is a fairly mainstream production in in a number of ways. You know, it's it's a, yeah. So, yeah, they, they position the, the whistleblowers as good guys who are unfairly, you know, the, the government and government agencies unfairly, you know, persecute them to, to keep secrets. And we see Agent Orange, a.k.a. William Rawlins, is now working at the CIA. Great reveal on his eye, and I really like his speech as well. And Stein talks to Dina, and we see Rawlins was listening to them. And Karen wants Frank not to kill, but to expose. I like the intercut Dina and Stein OIG interviews. And we don't see Stein answer, do you have any suspects? And let's see. Yeah, and you know, he tells Dina he didn't tell them the truth. Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio loves seeing her again. Is her character named Marion because she played Maid Marion in the 90s Robin Hood live-action movie? I mean, that's that's kind of a deep cut. That movie's, like, almost 30 years old by the time this... It's, yeah, you know... <laughs> no, I, I... It's... it's That's funny. That's legitimately funny. And that probably was one of the, the times that, like... I mean... I've been, you know, I, I think she was amazing in Scarface as well, but I could understand if some people were maybe kind of didn't completely approve of what they did with her character and thus weren't as eager to see her in other stuff. But in Robin Hood, she's, she's great, you know, mainstream Hollywood movie leading lady material. So, yeah. I like Danny, you know, pointing out that op Operation Cerberus in the original, you know, technically it's Operation Spot, and Danny made himself a sandwich, but not Frank, and he's like, yeah, so do you like the, the MREs, you know, and just, yeah, you know, I don't know, had the stuff in the fridge anyway, <laughs> and it's like, you know, yeah, Frank probably isn't used to looking for food in a fridge. You know, he's so used to the MREs and such. You know, so just, yeah. And Danny reads Life of Pi as a way to connect with his daughter. And Gunner fires arrows at Frank, hitting him with one. Explains why he made the recording. And, you know, what turns out to be Anvil troops attack Gunner and Frank with Roland's watching. And the duo Rambo, all of them, they do get wounded themselves. I quite like how Danny helped them with the drone and intel. Let's see. Yeah, tremendously entertaining scene. And... Let's see. Um...
I, I have to say, I didn't realize at the time that they were Anvil, only later when Billy, you know, basically said, you know, I lost Anvil men in the, the woods. But it does make sense, and it makes sense that, you know, Frank would realize, because, you know, there's, it's, it's illegal to use... U.S. troops on U.S. soil, so they couldn't possibly be official military. Yeah, that, you know, yeah, basically, because, you know, if you'll recall, they were wearing camo, and I, I mean, I guess there's a law against, yeah, I, I don't know, but, but certainly they were not you know, and then, yeah, they weren't, like, visibly wearing, like, for example, DHS, uh, you know, identification, kind of. Because, you know, when, when Billy and his Anvil men fight DHS people in the warehouse, the DHS people have the letters DHS written across their their clothes in, in plain white, so it's very easy to tell that that's what it is. And at that point, you either stop firing your gun at them, or you commit a crime by firing and we see the bunch of the feeds turn black Rollins got Gormand Frank did not show up for dinner which bothers Sarah and really hurts Leo and Frank collapses Danny spots him with a drone Dina and Billy have sex but she's on top she's clearly the more aggressive of the two I'm thinking this is her taking control of something after she felt she lost control with Frank so you know I've as I've said in other videos I don't think there's anything wrong with sex scenes I think it is good if they are not just there for titillation but character development and character study you know and yeah it's it's you know and it's also it really shows how far we've come because in some you know, some movies and TV will have the woman being on top as a way to demonize her and say, you know, ah, oh, she's not accepting the patriarchy, so she's evil. And, you know, and and it wasn't even a huge amount of time ago, because, you know, some, some of you might be able to remember Terminator 3, where that exact thing happens. So, yeah. And let's see. Yeah, I, I really like how this contrasts Danny and Frank as family men. Uh, you know, Frank is trying to be a good husband and father to Danny's family. Uh, let's see. You know, because it, it, this, this is not. Ideally, you don't want the dead family to be props, to just be there so that Frank. You know, like it's it's kind of like if they're if they're just there to explain to the audience, this is why he's so upset. This is why he's killing people. You know, I mean, you don't you don't even need like ideally a character should there should be something. Active characters are more interesting than passive characters, and an active character, you know, that means that they make some active choice, and we do see in flashbacks, like, you know, not every, like, there, there's that flashback to the, the fairy where Frank gets upset with Frank Jr. for, you know, like, basically making light of the, the war and you know, that, that kind of thing. So it's not that he never, you know, never ever got, you know, angry at, at his kids. And there's that thing of, you know, there is one of the last episodes where uh, there's this flashback and Frank is asked by Maria, are you home or is, you know, is your mind still in the field? So it's not that everything was, was perfect. And... Yeah, you know, because, cause like, at the end of the day, like, if you just want, oh, you know, this person hates these people, and he wants to kill them all, I mean, you could make that, you know, I don't know, he, maybe they, they burned something he really cared, you know, yeah, let's, uh, maybe he's a painter, he feels like he painted the best thing that, you know, ever, yeah, 
and they burn that, and so he starts killing. You know, I mean, that's I guess that's more of a villain backstory, but yeah, you know, there are movies where you know someone loses uh, um, loses an object and then starts killing people or or doing something truly evil at least and yeah I, I really appreciate that they have him be I I gotta say I did not think I did not see that coming I I'm really happy that they did that with with this season now that brings us to uh, did I forget oh whoops I forgot to note when I started talking about episode 5 um, Okay, I will go back and find the time code afterwards. Anyway, episode six, the Judas Goat. Let's see. Yeah, Frank dreams being welcomed home by his own family, Danny's, and then when the troops come in, execute them all. Just yeah, he wakes up at Danny's. PTSD amplifying the feeling many young men have that the people they love are better off without them, that they only put them in danger, make them miserable. And Danny wakes up Kurt, who grabs the gun under his pillow. And that's later we see Billy has taken that gun. And, yeah, you know, Danny tells Kurt Frank's dying. Kurt is perhaps the only person who knows he's still alive, wants to keep him that way, and has training to allow him to do that. You know, Karen would want to, but she doesn't have, the, you know, like... Ah, uh, what's it called? Um, Kurt, uh, you know, like they, for for the military, they teach you some, you know, medical stuff that, you know, in case you need it in the field. And like Daredevil and Luke Cage before him, Frank badly needs medical attention on his own show. And... Kurt doesn't think Danny will make things better for Frank, only himself. Dina and Billy have more sex, and he kisses her afterwards, which, I don't know, does he actually care, or is he just faking it, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I guess he is just faking that kind of thing. And, and I think this time, you know, she allows him to be in charge, which shows us that she's trusting him more. And the Christian Nationalist continues to antagonize at the PTSD group therapy meetings. And Leo and Sarah still have a good relationship, but Zach's relationship with the others is deteriorating. He stole a skateboard from another kid whose mom called Sarah. He slaps Leo, doesn't apologize. When Sarah calls him out for being a bully, he doesn't seem to feel any shame. Snitches and traitors, he calls his family. You know, probably feeling that Sarah and Leo betray Danny's memory by inviting in Frank, suspecting Leo snitched. If she didn't today, she'll do it tomorrow. And does he think that his father made a mistake? How much does he know about his father using the, you know, being a being a whistleblower? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, and, and Lewis, and I think the other guy is the white nationalist from the PTSD meetings, but I don't know, he, for some reason I, I couldn't really recognize him as that, but, you know, he walks off to avoid being arrested, as we learned later this episode, he is a liar, so no surprise that he, yeah, you know, they're passing out flyers about the Second Amendment, gun rights, the cop arrests Lewis, I believe the things he says to the cops about his own rights, you know, in, in the as far as protest goes, are factually accurate. It is true that peaceful protesters are getting arrested and abused by cops in America, but it's left-wing protesters, not right-wing protesters. I realized that some of that was after the show, but Occupy Wall Street began in 2011, before the show, long before the show premiered, and was written, so, yeah. And... Curtis bailed out Lewis, defends his actions with Billy, tells him the truth about the Christian Nationalist, getting a real Ted Nugent vibe from the Christian Nationalist. And... Let's see. 
Yes, Lewis confronts the white nationalists, they fight. At first it's an accident that he stabs him, but then he stabs him over and over. Frank apologizes to Sarah, tries to make her feel better. You know, because he knows that Danny is alive and will be able to take care of the family. Let's see. And yeah, we see that Billy is working with Rollins. And that brings us to episode seven Crosshairs. You okay? What happened to your shirt? I miss my shirt. You keep going like this, you're going to end up hurting yourself or somebody else. I really appreciate how supportive Lewis's father is shown to be. And Lewis freaks out about the killing, is about to suicide. Very compelling character. <coughs> <coughs> And Dina and Sam talk about bugs, and she once broke a guy's finger for putting his hand on her ass. Love it. If, you know, misogynists refuse to empathize with women, pain is the only way to get them to stop. And, and Billy really grossly tells Rollins about sex with Dina, so, yeah. And Bennett is with the Dom girl. I'm sure some military people are into that, so, yeah, that does... And Frank has to stay in the room for three minutes, but Billy and three others come in. Tells Bennett not to say anything, so Bennett puts the gag back in his own mouth. You know, I mean, the the this the the um, BDSM relationship is played for laughs, but it's not really saying that it's not it's not really a character flaw. Like it could be any kind of sex that he was having that would mean he lowered his guard to, to Frank, and, you know, yeah, the, the, let's see, and yeah, he even refuses to be shamed by Billy, you know, he says, as far as I am concerned, rank still matters. And Billy thought he had Frank, but gives away his position. Frank knocks him down with bullets, doesn't kill any of the four. And Frank talks to the young soldier, wounds him to get away. Lewis joins his dad watching an old fight. The conversation gets tense, but his father continues to try. I, I can't help but wonder if maybe there should have been at least one scene with the father after Lewis's death. But I guess Frank telling Lewis how he ruined his father's life is, you know, I mean, that does resolve that. You know, it, it is the, the, the government failed to help Lewis, and because of that, he ends up committing suicide and ruining his, his father's life. So, and, and becoming a domestic terrorist. So, yeah. And... Lewis makes a bomb, and we see the Christian Nationalist still dead where he killed him. Let's see. Sam and Dina swipe for bugs, find one. Colonel Bennett finds the dead Dom in the safe room bed. Billy stabbed him with a wrist blade, very Assassin's Creed of him. And Frank tries to snipe Rollins, but the glass is bulletproof. The alarms go off. I gotta admit, I really thought that the next episode was gonna start with Frank getting back away from the... But, yeah. So, the What the Flick people did... You know, they did a video after the first seven episodes, and another talking about the, the last six. So, they said, I didn't really buy that Billy would be working with Rollins. Why bother making the twist that he's a villain then? I think the Punisher works best if you have him interact with superpowered individuals. No live action version has that so far beyond the little we got in Daredevil Season 2. And that brings us to Episode 8 
cold steel. <clears throat> and Billy visits his mom in the hospital. And, you know, we, we can tell from early on that she's very scared of him. And he says, you had a choice, I never did. You saw to that. And she's tied down. He drugs her, visits her weekly. And, yeah, we find out, you know, he grew up in group homes. That is the reason he chooses evil. I don't personally believe that anyone is inherently good or evil. You can choose to do good. You can choose to do evil. The more times you choose evil, the more times you have to choose good after to make up for it. And, yeah, you know, Billy continues to choose evil throughout the season. Let's see. Injured in the line of duty. Wow. He was born at the top of the aisle. I really appreciate them pointing that out. Danny's paranoid. Frank calms him down, pointing out there's no chatter. He says, Frank, check on his family since the feet is down. I honestly thought that was going to turn out to be a trap, but I'm glad that they did what they did with it instead. And Billy and Dina have sex in the shower, and... I guess at that it's yeah I'm not entirely sure if I really see you know for, for the other ones I, I well I don't know maybe a shower to some people sharing a shower is maybe more intimate and more you know requires more trust than sharing a bed a lot of people will have one night stands and there's nothing wrong with that you know respect uh, consent and you know use protection depending on the situation you know a, a lot of people who do one night stands might not share a shower with the the person so so yeah that's what you know and yeah i really appreciate you know the show doesn't shame her for her sexuality it's not one scar on that pretty face i see what you did there and Billy tells Dina he was in the system. We get a good sense of why he has chosen to, 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 you know. And, yeah, to be clear, there's plenty of people who grow up in the system who don't go on to do awful things. But, but yeah, it is, again, you know, the American government failing people. You know, he wasn't a vet at the time, but, you know, yeah, it was, again, a person that they failed now yeah Frank goes to see Sarah we find out she just turned off the internet because she was punishing Zach Danny's very anxious at not getting any footage Frank plugs in the internet Sarah kisses Frank immediately regrets it she's drunk and a camera pan informs us that Danny drank liquor until he passed out at the keyboard and he had the the still of the of the kiss so he kept looking at it you know Yeah, and this is when it's completely confirmed that, you know, they were, the, the men in the forest were Anvil. And, let's see. Dina realizes there might still be a bug, so the real tactical plan is on paper for the team. Fake one online for Rollins. Actually, wait, was that, did she just leave the bug intact? Yeah, yeah, to, to flush them out, that's right, yeah. Micro should really avoid drinking. Any minute now, he'll be throwing up that triple double. Danny and Frank talk about meeting Maria and Sarah. When you know, you know. You're referring to falling in love, not long-time love, but the show has made it clear that both of these men would make sure to do things for their wives, so the... The show isn't saying that falling in love is enough for a long-term long relationship. For that, you need that creepy-uppy kind of love. I miss sex. Well, that got awkward. And Danny wants Frank and he to tell Dina the truth. Frank, can you please forget everything I said last night? I didn't mean to call you that. <coughs> Sarah, Sarah tells Frank she's worried Zach may 
hurt someone, shows a knife, that Crocodile D would raise an appreciating eyebrow at. Frank talks to Zack, talking him through using the knife. It becomes clear Zack isn't in interested in using on someone. He's scared, sad, and friendless. Immensely tense and suspenseful scene as the DHS people fight Billy and his... and, and the ex-anvil people. Sam unmasks Billy, almost takes him in, but the wrist blade makes short work of Sam. And Dina very clearly very upset at losing Sam. Frank and Zack toss the football back and forth. First smile from Zack this season, I think. Danny shows up. Frank has to tell him to go away, even promising to talk to Dina. And Dina is in a bathtub washing the blood off. Billy's there. I mean, that's only fair. He was the one who killed Sam. I just, seriously, that is a really messed up situation. That Billy pretends to worry about Danny when, you know, he could have ended up shooting her, or one of his men could have. And he's the one who killed Sam. Like, if he really cared about her, he would tell her the truth. And that brings us to episode 9, Front Toward Enemy. Let's see. Yeah, so we start with Frank and Danny on top of a roof, disagreeing on how to contact Dina, and explosion, and one of the explosions interrupted a birthday celebration. You know, it was Lewis, he has become a domestic terrorist, and sadly that is true of a statistically significant amount of American right-wingers. He sends a Zodiacian, or is that Zodiac-esque, letter to Karen, because she stood up for Punisher. And again, you know, making clear, you know, Punisher makes sure he only kills people who have killed people. He doesn't kill people that he politically disagrees with. And Danny and Frank disagree on how to handle the bombing. Frank invokes 9-11, says terrorists don't get what they want. They just bring people closer together. I don't want to take anything away from all the New Yorkers who helped each other in the wake of 9-11. And certainly, Al-Qaeda did not achieve everything they wanted with 9-11. But tearing away at American democracy was part of what they wanted, and they did achieve that. And it didn't only bring people together. It meant a lot of hate crimes against Muslims who had nothing to do with it and didn't agree with the attack at all. They just wanted to live their lives in peace in America. Hard-working people. And a number of people were intimidated into going along with the government and their unjust wars in the Middle East. You know, that's not the good kind of bringing people together. I do really respect that it acknowledges that white conservative terrorists are much more likely to be the perpetrators of terrorism on U.S. soil. On the radio, Karen, Senator Ori, and the host debate gun control. This is essentially my only real problem with, well, yeah, yeah, the politics in general, but the gun control stuff is probably my biggest issue with this season. I could, in theory, appreciate that it does let both sides present an argument, but this isn't a both sides issue. Progressives are not trying to prevent everyone from having a gun. What we're fighting for is to make sure that people who have been convicted of violent offenses can't get a gun because statistics show that they're likely to use the gun not for self-defense, but on someone who is who is not a danger to them, we're trying to make sure that things like ridiculous magazine sizes, high-powered ammunition, and the gun show loophole become illegal. This isn't what this isn't about what people feel about this issue. The numbers show that a huge amount of people in America die because of a lack of gun control. And actually, you know, if you look at the at polling, you know, for example, universal background checks is you know, uh, um, has majority support across party lines. It's ridiculously disingenuous to put Karen on the other side and say, well, some people do need a gun for self-defense. We're not trying to take away small guns from people who live in dangerous neighborhoods, provided they aren't beating their partner. Lewis calls into the radio show, expresses hurt feelings at Karen, because deep down that is what this is about for him, feelings. And Frank and... Kirk both recognize Lewis from the Latin on the radio show. So, of the of the six, let's see. 
yeah, of the, of the of the six first seasons of the yeah of the six season ones of Marvel Netflix shows, two of them have you know a man call into a radio show to tell a woman that he's upset with something she said about him that she you know or I mean in this case it was print but yeah again pointing out that that is like yeah the modern day villain is not a, you know doesn't have a twirly mustache you know yeah twirly mustache for him to and and the uh, yeah a mustache for him to twirl and ties maidens to to railroad tracks the modern villain is a misogynist who hurts women because they hurt his fifis. Very tense fight between Kurt and Lewis. And Frank and Mike will argue more, but Frank insists, we'll do it my way. Mistakes, he's made a few. And... And the senator is seeing fundraising due to the terrorist threat. He does say to Billy it's for the victim's families, but he tells Billy it wouldn't look good for him if the terrorist was shot in the head. And Frank finds Kurt still alive with a bomb on him. He beat me with my own leg. Luz used to be friends with Kurt. The guy with the fake leg. He had to break it off. And... Lewis has a gun trained on Frank, calls on Cell, tells Frank they're the same. So the show contrasts Punisher versus this right-wing domestic terrorist makes a lot of sense. Some people think Frank Castle is basically a domestic terrorist, and again, a lot of the right-wing idolize him. And Eventually, Lewis agrees, tells Frank to cut the white wire. It works. Let's see. I really appreciate, like, Frank could easily have left behind Curtis, uh, you know, like it's the frickin' rapture or something, but, you know, he does also say he blames himself for Curtis's leg. And Frank has to flee the cops, who of course think that he's, he is, is the bomber or is with the bomber, throws a rock, performs GTA, and... And because of the dashboard camera, it is revealed that Frank is still alive, which is obviously not good news for Frank, Dina, or Micro. And yeah, that's a very interesting turn of events. I, I quite appreciate. You know, really raises the stakes. Episode 10, Virtue of the Vicious. So by now, it's clear that every single one of the five Marvel Netflix titular leads lost at least one family member before the events of the series in some significant way. So far, I'm not sure if the family of Jessica Jones could have been saved from the car accident, but all the other ones are from murder. And I, I don't think it was necessary for the Marvel Netflix shows to have that many similarities uh, you know all of them are reluctant heroes even the team up is a reluctant team up between reluctant heroes and all of them have you know this this tragedy where like if you just look at for example phase one of the mcu yes you know tony actually yeah we 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 only find out later that tony had family members killed you know in in phase one you know Let's see. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Both Tony and Steve lost their parents at too young of an age, but Thor didn't. And the the you know where Tony and Steve were you know uh, only children. Steve did have a friend, which Tony didn't. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Did he have a friend when he was younger, or was it only when he became an adult? I'm I'm not entirely sure that I don't. Maybe Rhodey. Yeah, I, I don't remember how long they've known each other, but you know, certainly there are some differences. Thor has a number of, of friends, and he has a, a half brother that he loves as a full brother. And actually, yeah, come to think of it, he doesn't even know in the first movie. For most of the first movie, he does not know that they're not 
full brothers you know so so yeah there are significant differences between these people you know and the the uh, let's see then you have you know Bruce Banner is on the run he's the only of the of the phase one main characters to be on the run from people you know so there's there's some differences where in this you know all of them are you know each of these shows has a vigilante and each of the vigilantes in some way clashes with some people with authority where you know yeah again phase one Captain America doesn't particularly you know there's like once or twice he goes against orders but he never like clash there's never a a real threat that a soldier might take you know that a US soldier might take a shot at Captain America you know even but but on you know Marvel Netflix all of them there's a chance they'll get shot at by a cop you know so the the or, or the, I, I suppose there's not much of a chance Jessica will be shot at but she does some you know she almost gets arrested and you know she's the person of interest clashes with the cops is what I'm getting at Lewis kills the anvil guy, finds out he has birds, frees them, well, tries to. Billy's interrogated, lies, bites back. And I, th I think it works well, the, the chronological jumps in this episode. And Ori says, all gun, you know, it's not all guns taken away from certain people, it's certain, or, or wait, yeah. He he wants to take all guns away from certain people, not certain guns away from all people, as if the latter wouldn't be extremely useful. There's there's no reason for a regular civilian American to have like an an assault rifle and this whole kind of just yeah. Let's see. And yeah, Lewis stole animal gear from the guy he killed. Birdman. <clears throat> and yeah, we see some arguments back and forth between Karen and the senator. And I will say, you know, some of the time they do let him make his case, but other times they paint him as as wrong. Actually, yeah, come to think of it, the the um the take just put out a video, or yeah, very recently put out a video where they talked about the the annoying liberal I can real quick find annoying liberal uh yeah yeah two days ago and uh, I guess that might be the the um that's that's basically what's going on here isn't it it's another instance of, of that so yeah I'll just I'll direct you to their video they talk about them. yeah and yeah, you know the the senator is characterized as a coward who will save his own skin, not protect others. Frank took two to the chest, was wearing a vest. Billy and Dina speak frankly about talking about Castle. Let's see, and you know she she fires the gun to let him know. You know, I I am willing to shoot. He's like, you want to shoot me? Go ahead and shoot. Oh, 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 your barrel is really hot because you just fired the gun. And Billy shoots Frank since he may not get a good chance again anytime soon. Frank becomes aware Billy is not on his side. Dina realizes Billy killed Stein. You're gonna wish you shot me. I'm just really quickly gonna check if yeah, uh, that is not something that I need to deal with right away and in the kitchen Karen tries to talk down Lewis I sent you letters you could have been part of the solution but you chose to be a gas or a solid very tense suspenseful I, I know I say tense and suspenseful a lot uh, don't make it a drinking game you will get alcohol poisoning but yeah um, what can I say? I feel like it is apt. 
I really love when Frank, Karen, and Louis are in the kitchen. Frank tells Karen the white wire is the one to pull, but what Louis hears is, you did the right thing. You know, he thinks Frank is trying to talk him down, which clearly Frank doesn't think that he could still talk him down. And she can't pull the white wire at first because he pulls away his hand. Frank points out Louis has ruined his father's life, and Frank uses code to ask Karen if she does now have a gun in her purse since he knows that she used to and she confirmed, you know, look at her typical woman even now she has her her purse around her you know her, her neck Karen I bet you could tell me everything that is in that purse couldn't you and she says yes you know and and again like I mean Lewis maybe maybe he just barely has the wherewithal to be like that's an odd you know I, I didn't realize Frank was a misogynist. I, I didn't expect him to say that. But it's not, you know, I mean, he's holding... It would be... I, I, if, there's a, if there's an outtake, please direct me to it. It would be hilarious if right after Frank said that really misogynistic thing, then Lewis said, you know, he's, he's like still holding a gun to her head, and he's like, I don't know, Frank, I think you're being really rude to Karen. Let's see... But, but yeah, you know, uh, that is, yes, only engage in misogyny if you think it can save someone's life. If it isn't saving someone's life, don't do it. And, let's see, because, you know, yeah, she used to have a gun in her purse, but he knows that she didn't in the, you know, when, when the senator and her were talking and it makes sense you know they're not gonna let her get close to a senator with a gun in her purse but she let, let's see did she grab the gun from the I, I don't remember ex exactly when and where she got the gun but yeah you know and yeah I think it might have been in in there that she got the the gun with the and yeah, and, and when she's ready for the white wire, he tells her, now, she shoots Lewis in the foot. Now the bullet from when Lewis shot himself in the foot when you took on Frank has company. Frank manages to shove him into the freezer room where the bomb will kill no one but Lewis himself. I gotta say, until I saw that, I had no idea how the episode was going to end without Lewis killing someone with the bomb. And I knew from early on that it couldn't be Karen or Frank, and it wouldn't really make sense for Frank to let Lewis kill someone else. And Frank poses as a hostage taker of Karen so that he can get into the elevator without the police trying to shoot him. He refused to leave the kitchen until he was sure Lewis blew himself up, since otherwise Lewis might be able to blow up kitchen staff. Or if he hid, maybe there, you know, in there, maybe someone would accidentally let him out and then he'd be a threat again. And in the elevator, Frank and Karen nearly kiss. The episode ends with us seeing Frank get away from the building by ziplining. Yeah, um, the, the, um, I'm, I, I admire how many times the man, because, because I feel like maybe, maybe they got a, you know, let's see, not studio note, I guess, net, network note that said, make sure the protagonist kisses, you know, let's see, I, th yeah, yeah, we see him, he almost kisses Karen, he, you know, he didn't initiate the kiss with Sarah, but he doesn't back away in time for it to not be a kiss. And we do see him kiss Maria in flashbacks, so, yeah, you know, even though he isn't a romantic lead, they managed to have him kiss, you know, two and a half women. So that's, yeah. I gotta say, Frank taking out the domestic terrorist while the gun control senator cowardly flees for his life comes dangerously close to being as tone deaf as when Marky Mark said, if I'd have been there, things wouldn't have gone down like that. I realize that today he goes by Mark Wahlberg, but when he says something that immature, I'm going to refer to him as Marky Mark. That brings us to episode 11, Danger Close. And Frank is understandably shocked that Billy betrayed him. 
frequently appears as a guest on WHIH, the MCU-specific news network that Christine from Iron Man 1 and 2 is on. We see Dina, Micro, and Frank react. Frank tends to his wounds, annoyed at and by Micro, as usual. Frank, come on, whatever happens next, at least let me stitch this mud up, Phil. And Micro could have been a vet, then discovered computers. He's got kind of a Dracula thing going on, always running around that bathrobe that reaches the ground. You know, and yeah, when when he, you know, meets back up with, with Sarah, which also, I gotta say, I really appreciate that happened this season, instead of them doing this thing of, like, the the, episode, the the very last shot of the season is him knocking on the door and then like it goes to black we hear the sound of a door opening and credits and we're supposed to wait until next season to find out you know, yeah anyway you know when when he and Sarah talk you know he says I've been you know I've spent the last year in in my bathrobe in a dirty basement and she says you look like it you could really use a shower and my course family discuss Pete now that they know that there's something yeah that's a nice suit I hope it's bulletproof now nah, you're thinking of John Wick you know efficient and lean profession professional killing machine but yeah I, I like Dina trying to intimidate uh, Billy at Homeland and Rollins is completely honest with Marion for once. Frank makes the skull shirt again. I don't think I said this in the in the Daredevil season two thoughts. So I will say here one of the what the flick people said. Oh wow, that you know the really compelling this this ah crap, what's it called um, X ray of of my skull. I think I'll put it on my shirt. It is kind of weird, but you do have to explain it. Like, you know, I've I've jested before that, you know, a, a white skull on a, a white human skull on a ba black background, that's pirate. That's if if you don't know Punisher, then you're not immediately going to think, oh, you know, Punisher. You're going to think, is my ship being boarded and robbed of its valuables? You know, it's not. I don't know. I, I, I realize that the the like if he wore like um, what's it called like the the ah, uh, what's it called again? The the it's the twenty eight days later. The the hold on. I think I can find it pretty quickly. Um. um Hmm. You're kidding. Um, the oh, is it? Is it only the second one, not the first one? Maybe I. Um, I'm gonna see if I can't find it real quick, because I know it is in here, because I read the. Um, um okay um yeah so the the 28 days later the the cover it has the um the the symbol for you know toxic chemical bio, bio, biological danger Obviously, if he had that on, people would think, oh, he's contagious. So, you know, it had to be something. And I guess if he just had, like, a gun on there, people might think, oh, wow, he's a very forward arms dealer. But okay, sure, um, Mr. Mr. Man, I will, I would like to buy some guns from you. So, yeah. But I acknowledge, you know, the skull is iconic. Everyone, you know, we can immediately recognize it. I I do love the look, but it, it does, it, it is a little, it makes more sense in a comic book than necessarily live action. And 
yeah, the, 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 the subtitles identify him as Jack, posing as a cop, walking into Sarah's house. He almost gets away, but... Or, or, she almost gets away, but then there's another guy posing as a cop. Very clever of Leo not to come down the stairs and Sarah to send her away secretly. We know we can count on Leo to do what her mother says. You know, she's a very obedient, well-behaved child, so, yeah. Micro lets it be known he is not a fan of the Skull logo. And Micro and Frank realize Micro's family was taken, so Micro starts memorizing the Liam Neeson speech. And... Yeah, I, I quite like, you know, Frank calls Leo, directs her, you know, having realized she must not have been kidnapped. Sarah, Sarah, every time I'm about to say Zach, but I start by saying Sarah, I accidentally say Zara. Sarah reassures Zach they won't get killed, she won't let that happen. And Billy and Rollins discuss the situation. Rollins got on the tip line. And Marion is told directly of what Rollins is accused of by Dina. The two do not get along. Damn, Mary Elizabeth Manson Joni, you can still pull off amazing performances. I've known her a long time. Marion is one of the good times. It's that Robin Hood fella you gotta watch. Badass montage of Frank. Packum Parabellum, or Preparing for War, if you're nasty. And Danny comes to Leo very emotional as they hug for the first time in a year. I really appreciate that since we've seen Leo really likes Pete's presence in a number of scenes in the season, of course she would trust him when he calls, even after the TV calls him a terrorist. And amazing reveal on Frank with the white skull. I take back anything negative I said about the White Skull. Now, and, you know, animal men go into the hideout. Frank takes them out one by one, stealthily, but brutally and lethally this time. You know, not like the, the at, at Bennett when he wasn't killing people. And Frank throws a head, which at first just throws off the anvil men, then they realize there was a grenade on it. If he had just thrown the grenade, they would have immediately recognized it and been able to take cover. But it is this thing of like, holy crap, that's brutal. He he cut off a guy's head. Oh crap, there's a grenade there. You know, just yeah. And yeah, in in the comics, he does sometimes cut people's heads off and throw them for dramatic effect. Which I think is the the possibly the best. Re it's it's top three of best reasons to throw decapitated heads. And Frank shoots some of them, uses a bomb, shoots some more. Badass. I really love, you know, and we also get the, the before this, we get the montage of him making the bomb. And just, I've seen a bunch of times where, like, they'll, they'll unscrew a light bulb and, you know, pour in, like, gunpowder or something and then screw it back in. And it's just, you know, it really puts us to shame when we screw out a light bulb because the, you know, it, it, ah, crap, what, what is it called? It, it, like, it burned out or something, and then we don't have the right one to screw in, and, you know, we accidentally bought the wrong one, and then we didn't return it to the store because we were embarrassed that we bought the wrong one, so we're just, you know, so we're just in the dark. And he figures the last one might have info, so he goes slow, uses a knife. Knife to see you. And Frank questions Jack, who knows nothing, so he shoots him in the head. And Marion with Rollins, wasn't me. That's your name sign on the order. Wasn't me. You even did in the shower. Wasn't me. And I quite liked when she said, you disgust me. And that bit about, you know, I don't care if shit splatters onto me. I... You know, I am going to reveal everything if this isn't, you know, yeah. Leo and Micro Bond, there's a song on the radio she likes. She and a friend of hers made up a dance to it, which, you know, yeah, that's, that is the kind of thing that I, I don't have, you know, a daughter of my own, but 
some of my some of my siblings have uh, you know I, I hesitate to call them children because they're adults by now but the uh, offspring they have offspring and when some of that offspring was younger you know I feel like I heard at least one of them say that she made up a, a dance with one of her friends for, for this song she liked so yeah and that's also like you know for all the the very emotionally like there's a lot of characters in this show that are very messed up in a lot of ways and here is someone who's actually quite well adjusted that's that's a very normal thing for for someone of that age to do let's see I really appreciate the show doesn't paint Dina letting Billy too close as her being an irrational woman. The way the show treats it, basically a man could easily have made the exact same mistake. She's a complex character who sometimes makes mistakes, and let's be honest, she gets a lot of things right as well. She did manage to lure Anvil people into a trap, for example. And yeah, you know, for sure, it was a mistake. She should have been more careful to not let him so close before she knew him better and yeah you know that is you know sometimes when someone really charms you you let them close to you and sometimes you get hurt and that brings us to episode 12 home and we see Frank gives his testimony to the camera and Dina Micro and Leo with DHS, another emotional scene. Micro and Dina, he tries to take control. He no longer believes in the system. Help me get my family back, and I'll give you what you need, not before. And, yeah, Frank tells Dina that he was the one who killed Zubair. And yeah, yeah, I guess she comes. She comes to forgive him by the end of the finale because he kills the people who made it happen. It's not like Frank would have gone out and killed Zubair if he wasn't ordered to. And Zach and Sarah realize Danny is alive, just for show to make sure we behave. Yeesh! I guess turning off the Wi-Fi is not an option in this situation. I'm I'm joking. It's it's really really cool that they you know they if, in case you haven't watched the episode in a while so they they have knives the the Anvil people have knives they stab a hole in in these there's a there's a, a tank of gasoline to you know tied to the back of Zach and Sarah and yeah they get these these lit flares out so that if you know, like like Frank says, if they do not behave, they're gonna light those things, and it's you know, and and they do actually end up lighting, and then Micro, you know, really quickly, he he does he does he manage to put out the fire? Just just slow it down enough that it's, uh, yeah. And Frank was caught. Micro was shot. Though it turns out both of these things were planned. We get another welcome back said to Frank, which. I feel like at, at this point they're almost trolling us. It's, you know, it, it would be annoying if they weren't providing a lot of really cool welcome back content instead of just, you know, title dropping it. And Billy interrogates Frank in Micro's lab. I am gonna kill Bill. I gotta admit, they totally got me with Micro's fake death. I thought he actually had died. I was so pissed off at the show for killing him off. I'm really, really relieved to find that he wasn't. Danny goes into the room with his family. Dude totally has Jesus beat on coming back from the dead fast. Twice in a year, one of them in a few hours. Forget three days. And let's see. And Roland's arrives at the lab. Frank insults Billy by saying he are, he is Roland's dog, when obviously Billy has issues with other people having power over him. Very smart of Frank, and it pays off. He gets Billy to go against Roland's just enough. Roland's wants revenge. Knocks out one of Frank's teeth, punching him so hard in the face. An eye for a tooth, as the saying goes. Let's see. 
you know, and as the, you know, there's the, there's of course the, the criticism of that kind of Old Testament thinking that goes, an eye for a tooth leaves the world with a toothache and unable to blink, but lucky enough to have an excuse to wear a monocle. And Frank remembers sex with Maria. The the what the flick people. One of the what the flick people said this was very awkward. Yeah, I guess it it kind of, it maybe maybe kind of was the the. I mean, I get I get it. I get what they're going for. They are doing this thing of you know when he is in in an extreme physical like you know there's there's adrenaline pumping and he's. He is feeling sensor, you know, sensory input a lot. Uh, you know, his mind goes to to the this other kind of experience. You know, on the other end of the that same spectrum, uh, if you're going by Hellraiser. Yeah, it was it was maybe kind of awkward. All he wants is the chance. And Frank was supposed to leave the thingy they could trace on so they could find him, but he took it off. That, and everything that came after, was just madness. A lot of blood on and from Frank's mouth. He's rarely talkative, but now all his lines are grunts. Oh, and groans. Mumbling. I'm ready, Bill. Ready for the big ride, baby. And Frank seemingly gives them what they want. Mike, so Micro told Frank the password and programmed it to his eye. They found the gun, but not the knife. He stabs Rollins and tries to bite his neck, his precious scrawny little neck, or, or maybe the ear, Mike Tyson style. And Rollins tells Frank what he's going to do to him. He really is a monster. I really love that they set up a camera that was activated by Frank's retinal scan. We don't see it for sure in this episode, but it really seems like that's going to allow gathering evidence on Rollins and Billy. And I th yeah, I think we do see that in the finale, that that's how they, yeah. I really love the contrasting lines of dialogue about serve. And Rollins makes the huge mistake of calling Billy just a stupid grunt. That is definitely not something Billy is going to let slide. And he's smart enough to be sneaky about his betrayal of Rollins. You know, like he... He cuts, or at least partially cuts, the wire holding the the, um, uh, the strip. I guess is that what they're called? Um, yeah, you know, holding Frank's hands together. Come home, Frank. Very cleverly used as a cinematic device. He's basically ready to accept being dead, but once he gets a shot at killing Rollins and staying alive, even though based on his walk, I don't think he's a woman's man. I am home, and Rollins gives Frank a shot of adrenaline, thinking it will make the pain last that much longer and be that more intense, not realizing Frank is just about ready to attack him. And yeah, Roland is indeed going to take Frank's eye with the knife, and Billy Russo happily lets Frank kill Rollins. I'm a reminder of the mess you left when you went away. Frank gouges out Roland's eyes, and Billy is shot at but gets away. Frank is rescued by Micro, who tries to get his energy up by saying he betrayed him to call him an asshole or a piece of shit. And that brings us to the finale, Memento Mori. A lot of Latin this season, but it tends to... Yeah, it, it always makes sense. And let's see... I, I'm not saying there's something wrong with Latin. It's a it's a great language. Uh, you know, we owe a lot to it. It's, you know, a lot of other languages have have a, you know owe a debt to the Latin language. But and and I do disagree with with Pepper Potts. Technically speaking, you can speak it. It's just that not very many people do. But it can get kind of pretentious to just you know put a bunch of of Latin. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm above it. I once titled one of my short films uh, Latin. And I think it was just because I really liked that Deus Ex was a Latin phrase. So, yeah. 
since they can't take Frank to the hospital, they go to Dina's parents. Dad, her father seems to be a doctor. We both know sometimes a criminal is a freedom fighter. Billy shoots his way out of his office right after DHS get there, using the radio to find out where they are. Love the classic music they play. He blows it up, and as we know, cool guys don't look at explosions. Where's the van? Where are we left it? Where are we agreed? And I'm guessing that's how he got the guns for, for later. You don't have a Monopoly on payback, Frank. It's been a long time since I played Monopoly, and maybe if I tried today, I'd be super bored. If they made a payback Monopoly, I think I could be, be down for that. Like, you know, in, instead of building up, like, a uh, um, real estate empire, you're, like, gradually working your way up the, uh, um, what's it called? You know, you're, you're not racing to, to make a lot of money and build a lot of property, own a lot of property. You're working your way, you're, you're racing to work your way up the food chain to find out who betrayed you, get payback, or, or at the very least, m maybe you already know who betrayed you, but how to get to them. And, you know, that's, I, I think that would be really cool. And, and they could just call it Payback Monopoly. Let's see. If I see you again, all bets are off. I will shoot you down or take you in. And I really like how the whole thing with Kirk, like, at first it seems like, oh, I guess Billy has the control in this situation, you know, and, and Billy keeps saying, no, you know, go ahead, put your leg on. You can get out of bed. Sure, cup of coffee, I could go for that, you know. And Kurt opens the Kurt ends. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, he's he just got out of bed. It's like, you know, it's light out. Why would you not, you know, he's, yeah. So, so Billy, you know, and Billy, they, ah, I should not go near the window. You know, he doesn't think it must be a trap, but he's just like, it, there could be, you know, Frank might have realized. He doesn't think that Kurt and Frank agreed to, to do this, you know. And, yeah, so, so Billy, you know, Kurt fi finishes a cup of Kobe, coffee, hands it towards him, and Billy gets up and, oh no, you know, and, and ducks out of, out of the way, and, and Frank fires the, the sniper. I really loved how they, they set that up. It, you know, Kurt legitimately had the, the patience and the, and the lying skills, like, he completely fooled Billy, and honestly, myself. But, but yeah, you know, makes sense that, like, Actually, come to think of it, I guess it is possible that Kurt just figured that Frank would be there because that is basically, yeah, I think is, let's see, Kurt is the only ally Frank has left that Billy knows about and can easily get to, you know, he's not going to be able to get to Dina. She has the DHS backing her up, you know. So so it's basically that. And Kurt and Frank both know this. It's not even necessary for them to directly co contact each other. Any way you want it, that's the way we need it. Midnight at the Painted Ponies. What, do you have a son the same age as Frank Jr.? And we get a flashback. Billy is great with Frank's family, so it's really, really sad that he betrayed them all. Safe house. More like shit house. Please, it's latrine. They changed the name for a reason. Sarah sexually wants David. Very natural, healthy. I appreciate how much of it is a close-up of her face instead of male gaze. And let's see. Billy comes upon the two employees of Central Park Carousel. I wonder if that guy is the one who gives or the one who receives, not taps. Dina types up her report, sees the location as the carousel. And yeah, Billy took hostages because he is, you know, he really is a monster. And Frank uses a grenade launcher, and then they 
there's some dueling AR action, and they're on the carousel. Really chaotic, great stuff. Really, really love it. You know, I, I, I would. I would MST3K that when you know Billy turns off the carousel, it's ba you know he's he's just doing the the editing team a favor because it is exhausting for them to edit all this you know really really chaotic yeah but no if you know yeah at first he figured you know there are. Like, there's a greater chance that Frank might accidentally shoot a hostage than me, because there's two of them, only one of me. I'm hidden, they're out in, you know, in front. And if he shoots a hostage, even if it's just a wound, if he's, he's going to be really devastated, it's going to be super easy for me to do, you know. And Billy shoots Frank in the chest. Frank shot at Billy's... Right. First, Frank sh shot Billy's face. Then Billy shoots Frank in the chest. Epic blade duel. Even Frank didn't know about Billy's wrist blade. I, I like that detail. And the mirror shard gut stab. And Frank drags Billy's face across the broken mirror. And this is where it really... Like, at times he is basically kind of a, a sociopath, but you do understand, like, Billy is incredibly cruel himself. Frank is repaying that cruelty. You know, it's it's not an accident that, you know, he doesn't do this with, you know, let's see. For example, that soldier that was just following orders, trying to protect Bennett, you know, he wounded him. But, uh, yeah, and he never, he never does it to a cop, you know, he throws, like, a rock at a cop to, to, you know, but, uh, yeah. Let's see. And Billy would rather die than live with his face messed up, and when Frank realizes that, he does want him to, to go on living. And DHS and CIA are not looking for Frank. He gets a pass. Billy's in a coma. It was 11 hours under the knife. You know, they, they said he missed a payment. And Frank won't join Micro at Thanksgiving. So it won't be Franksgiving. And Frank finally joins the PTSD group therapy. I appreciate that the episode and season ends on this downbeat note. You know, instead of, like, a big action thing, something brutal. With everyone punished, he's ready for group therapy. He's ready for sharing. Dina is happy to have let Frank punish the ones she wanted punished. Every major plot has been resolved. Definitely best action of any Marvel Netflix show so far. Um... I have always been a big fan. When we're talking action movies, I do like it better when it's, you know, guns and that kind of thing than hand-to-hand -hand fighting. So, you know, obviously on that alone, this show is going to have a higher, it's, you know, get a, yeah, I'm going to like it more just for that. But they also did a really great job of it. They selected some really cool guns. They had them used in cool ways and, like, logical, tactical ways. You know, you can really tell when an action movie is made by people who know or yeah when when there are people involved in the production who know what guns can do and what situations they're good for and ones where they don't have that you know and yeah um i thought they did a really great job with with the hand to hand stuff and all this really brutal stuff Let's see. Yeah, uh, most satisfying climax of all the Marvel Netflix shows. Although I do still, uh, you know, the 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 action in the in the Daredevil season one is also really great, and uh, yeah, and the season two one as as well. And the you know, I would still say the one that most got to me emotionally was the Jessica Jones climax, but that wasn't really an action climax. Uh, let's see. And, and, you know, this had some of the villains I love to hate the most. 
And I appreciate that the show through Danny points out Frank just kills everyone he interact interacts with. He's a psycho. He has to have other things in his life than violence. And yeah, I, you know, I hate to say it, but as with the other Marvel Netflix, I, th I think so far The Defenders is the only one that escaped this. There are still too many episodes. I will definitely say none of them were filler, and I thoroughly enjoyed all the episodes. But if we were, like... If they didn't have this idea that it has to be 13 episodes, I think this would have been good with 9 or 10. And, you know, there, there are some things that in the show could have gone a little quicker... But, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying that there's any, like, entire episodes that I would just say to skip or something. And, yeah, interesting stories, you know, Micro knowing about Frank, Frank being alive, becoming public knowledge, and the whole thing with Lewis. And, let's see, the... Uh, I'm just going to make sure to do this while I remember. There we go. Okay, so some critic quotes. Let's see. Beats are performed rep repetitiously, repetitiously until they numb those watching. After a while, the attempt to visually express Frank's emotional turmoil and sense of culpability for his family's tragic death fails to resonate at all. Yeah, I, I can see what they mean, but I don't really agree. I, that wasn't how what what I felt. But I suppose, like, if you're not a huge fan of the character, like, I could watch... I, I would watch ten seasons of, of Marvel Netflix Punisher. You know, I would watch ten movies. You know, but if you're not, like, a super fan, and even if you are, you might still have, have an issue. And I don't think there's anything wrong with people who aren't fans criticizing something. Uh, yeah, more critic quotes. At a time when mass shootings, gun control debates, and domestic terrorism are all over the news, a show insightful and brave enough to critique our culture of violence might have had a real impact. The Punisher is not that show. Yeah, and that's, you know, I got into some of that in the in this video already, but yeah. No matter how many sad faces Frank Castle makes about his trauma, the Punisher can never escape the terrible gravity that its most basic purpose is inviting viewers to enjoy watching an angry man murder as many people as he can. And again, you know, I, it's, it's, you know, what what is the term? Uh, this, you know, Punisher is my problematic fave. Um, I know, you know, when I when I was 13, I thought, oh yeah, I just gotta kill all the bad people. Actually, no, wait, no, I, I think I just, no, no, I appreciate the catharsis of it, but I don't think, yeah, maybe when I was a child, I, I believed in, you know, revenge as, as a thing, but, I'm, and I'm not saying, you know, it's, you, you can believe in revenge, just please don't go out shooting people, or killing them, or, or hurting them. Let's see. See. Uh, you know, only if, if you think that you can get someone to stop doing something harmful, you know, I, I do think that it is okay to not, not, not harass, but like mock people that make really awful political arguments that, and they're, what they're arguing for hurts people, then I think it's okay to, to mock them. But beyond that, you know, only ever use violence if it's to, to stop greater violence, is, is my philosophy on the matter. Where Barnes, who plays Billy Russo, falters, and where the supporting characters take a dip is in any scenes involving director Dina Madani. She serves as the weakest part of the series because her story is mostly relevant, focused, and is used only to bring Castle back into the focus of the government, as well as foil most of the major action set pieces towards the back half of the season. Her story was predictable, not of a forgiving nature. Her actions were mostly predictable. It was easy to tune out any time she was on screen until the later episodes, where her resolution actually affected the outcome of Frank's storyline. I suppose I see what they mean, but it wasn't something that bothered me personally. And, yeah, the, the, uh, what the flick people pointed out, by the end, every good guy tells Frank to, to kill. And 
I do also think that was, yeah. Now, when the Punisher was created, and for a lot of the comics, the idea of a man exacting brutal revenge with guns, killing the people responsible for the death of his loved ones, was considerably less problematic than today. Back then, some were upset at the violence that the comics depicted, because they felt the people reading them were too young to see such things, but there were a lot of movies featuring characters like that, with a character, uh, let's you know, but yeah, today we know that the characters idolized by American police. Many hate crimes in America are motivated by fear of being replaced by immigrants, which for those who haven't heard about that absurd conspiracy theory is, you know, it is being treated by the people who peddle it and also those who actually believe it as an existential threat. So while it is not killing as revenge, it is killing in order to survive. So basically today, if you're going to do the Punisher, you know, a great way to limit how much negative attention you're going to get for it you know, you have to actually examine it. You can't just have, you know, a, a, a lot of killing, which, you know, yeah, ultimately none of the movies are only that, but all three movies do have, you know, clearly part of the, the appeal of the movies is that. And let's see... Yeah, so, um, all of the Marvel Netflix shows, up to and including this one, worst to best, I love all except Iron Fist Season 1, Iron Fist Season 1, Daredevil Season 2, The Defenders, Punisher Season 1, Luke Cage Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, and Jessica Jones Season 1. So, yeah, um... I hope you enjoyed this episode and uh, uh, this video and yeah uh, so yeah next is Jessica Jones which I gotta admit I'm really looking forward to she, she, like I said season one of Jessica Jones is still my my favorite of these but yeah um, and and I hear good things about Iron Fist season two so as far as I understand, only good things lie ahead in these, yeah. But yeah, um, that is everything, so I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.